everybody. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining the First Amendment Museum for Curating Under Pressure. Uh, today we're joined by First Amendment Museum board member, Dr. Janet Marstein. This is part of our online speaker series. So uh, if you're new to us, the First Amendment Museum is a nonpartisan nonprofit museum located in Augusta, Maine. I'm Max Nospich, the Manager of Education and Visitor Experiences here at the First Amendment Museum. We rely on uh, gifts from viewers like you to continue the work we do. So if you enjoy this presentation, uh, please consider donating to us. And I'll get that link in the chat below in just a moment. Also, check out our website and YouTube channel for more content like this. As I mentioned earlier, I'm joined by Dr. Janet Marstein, an honorary associate professor of museum studies, retired at the University of, well, I know I'll butcher the pronunciation of this, Leicester in the UK. Leicester. Leicester in the UK. She is currently an independent scholar based in Yarmouth, Maine. She writes on diverse aspects of museum ethics from curatorial ethics to negotiating the pressures of self-censorship to artist intervention as drivers of ethical change. Marstein is the author of six books, including the topic of today's talk, Curating Under Pressure, International Perspectives on Negotiating Conflict and Upholding Integrity. In 2018, she was a senior research fellow at Fudan University in Shanghai. How did I do with that one? Great. Great. Dr. Marstein has a particular interest in recognizing and supporting the agency of practitioners to make informed ethical decisions. She has done ethics consulting with institutions from the National September 11th Memorial Museum on Collections Policy to the Royal Air Force Museum on Sponsorship. She sat on the Ethics Committee of the UK's Museum Association from 2014 to 2019, helping to move their approach from one of policing to empowerment. Presently, we're happy to say she sits on the board of the First Amendment Museum. So Dr. Marstein, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to have you. Thank you very much. So today I'm going to talk about this project of curating under pressure. And I wanted to start by first acknowledging my co-editor for this project um, with whom I couldn't have, have uh, accomplished what I did. Um, sorry, hold on one second. Uh, let me see if I can do it. There we go. Um, Svetlana Mincheva, who is a program consultant at the no National Coalition Against Censorship in New York. And um, this is also a very particularly helpful organization if you are a curator or an artist who themselves is having issues around censorship or self-censorship and need some tools. They have great guidelines online or if you're finding that uh, that those guidelines um, uh, aren't enough for you um, and you need some one-on-one -on -one help, she's uh, she's fantastic. So uh, so I encourage you to uh, to go to her um, if need be if you find yourself in a really difficult situation. So uh, so and she has an amazing essay in the, in the book as well. So I wanted to start by talking around, talking about the title of the of the book, curating under pressure, and just mentioning first of all the great ironies in the whole project, the fact that uh, that in fact um, the word self censorship or censorship that that um, that's not even in the title. And um, we didn't include the term censorship or self-censorship in the title, in part because we were actually censoring ourselves in a way. Um, we were protecting our sources in a way. Um, uh, of course, you know, that title signals that the book was about censorship and self-censorship, but um, but on the other hand, doing it in a way that um, that might evade um, certain kinds of censors uh, uh, that might not really understand uh, the analytical depth that we were going into um, and uh, might protect us as well. Um, 
you know, as I was working in Hong Kong and China at the time. So, um, and at the same time, we also felt that curating under pressure was actually a more apt title than self-censorship because it also captured the actual action or feeling um, of what self-censorship was. <laughs> So oh, for us, um, it wasn't just a capitulation, but a way of really expressing what was happening on the ground. At the same time, I want to acknowledge absolutely these ironies of um, working in this field of censorship and self-censorship studies that I found that you couldn't really do it or I couldn't really be a part of it without engaging myself in self-censorship, at least on some level. Um, sometimes I was doing it only in the short term to think about longer term goals. Um, but there, you know, but it was constantly working through various minefields and um, and thinking about the risks, not only to myself, but to my sources and um, and uh, thinking about um, oh, what were what were the most important priorities for the project. So, uh, so it was constantly thinking about the ethical, uh, uh, you know, what were the, you know, the the real ethics of uh, uh, of what we were going through, and there was a lot of analysis all the time, and it was constantly changing, a very very dynamic thing. So um, full of all kinds of ironies. What were the motivations for doing this project? Um, one um, very important one is that we saw negotiating the pressures of self-censorship as a key and largely unrecognized issue in museum ethics. So my field has largely for many years been museum ethics and, um, uh, and self-censorship is one area that has been, I think, really neglected. Um, I, in the 1990s, um, late 80s and 90s, actually, in the late 80s, I was uh, a pre-doctoral fellow at the Smithsonian during the first culture wars. So working at the Smithsonian, at the, um, at the Smithsonian American Art Museum, at the time of the first cultural war. So when the curators there were preparing um, for the West as America exhibition, um, where there was a big flap about um, the interpretation of that show. Um, the show was highly critical of an idealistic concept of the American frontier as um, something that was pure, uh, manifest destiny concepts, and that critique those concepts as something um, that uh, um, had underlying um, kind of racist um, notions of uh, Native American peoples, for example, um, looked at environmental impacts, for example, looked at issues of hypermasculinity. Um, a mistake was that they didn't really prepare the uh, audience for such a, at that time, 
very kind of radical interpretation, but it was Congress that was really uh, up in arms about this, particularly a very um, conservative right-wing Congress that uh, um, that was very threatening about funding. And there were also other snafus um, at the Smithsonian, at the Air and Space Museum, for example, um, with uh, with an exhibition about uh, um, about the uh, bombing of uh, uh, of Japan, the um, the atomic bombing of of Japan, and um, uh, uh, and there were other uh, culture war exhibitions as well, including uh, exhibitions by um, a Robert Maplethorpe uh, and um, uh, who was a, a gay photographer who included um, homoerotic imagery. So um, I was heavily influenced by these culture wars and um, when I started to see um, all these years later, a similar kind of rhetoric erupt, but erupt um, not only this time from the right, but also from the left, um, uh, I became uh particularly uh intellectually um and ethically interested in what was happening so what's new with this second set of culture wars is that um we have a social media involved now and we also have a political left involved. So there are new fears, not only to uh, um, to fear of um, offending the political right and to lose funding, for example, but also fear of offending the political left. Um, audiences, for example, fear of offending audiences is uh, is very um, uh, is very foremost in a lot of uh, the minds of museum uh, leadership right now. I also felt that um, the traditional dialectic between freedom of speech and censorship was inadequate to address this issue today. And that was the dialectic that was primary in a lot of the analysis that went on during the first culture war, is that it was seen primarily as an issue between freedom of speech and censorship. And that I thought that it was much more entangled than that, that the, um, that what was actually happening on the ground was much, much more entangled and um, that it wasn't a yes or no, that there was total freedom of speech or that there was censorship, but that in fact, it was much more of a spectrum that was occurring on the ground. And that's what our, um, that's what our, uh, research, in fact, tells us that I'll be talking about today. And then our fourth um, motivating factor was that we wanted to move beyond the Anglo-American discourse. So much of the culture war discourse that went on um, from the 1980s and 90s really primarily involved the US. There was a little bit around the UK, but mostly the US. And we wanted to really look around the world. That was very important to us. 
So in the book, there were chapters from authors um, in contexts as diverse as Turkey and Colombia, uh, Qatar, Palestine, Russia, Hong Kong, China, my, that's my chapter, um, the UK, the US, Israel, etc. So the book argues that practitioners today faced a host of, faced a host of pressures to self-censor from both the left and the right, and that negotiating these pressures requires strategic thinking, robust ethical deliberation, and resilience, and that it's really important to remember that this doesn't just happen kind of um, somewhere else. So in authoritarian countries, although it certainly does, but it happens everywhere. And that it's important to understand um, that what happens in China, for example, um, might in some ways, um, if we know what's happening in China, it might help us to understand, even though it's very different, it might help us to understand how we might be able to strategize better in the United States or in the UK or in Germany. And it's particularly important um, in Western countries as museums recognize their potential in civil society by providing a space to engage with contentious issues. So if we believe that museums are going to make an impact by, by engaging with contentious issues, then we have to understand that we'll be faced with the pressures to self-censor. And, and so we have to be equipped to, to deal with those pressures. We have to be prepared in advance rather than necessarily, you know, um, responding at the last minute when we're faced with a crisis. And the big idea um, that I kind of really learned, kind of the thesis um, concept that I really learned from, uh, from my collaborators in the work that I did in the in the research network that I convened in Hong Kong with Hong Kong and mainland Chinese practitioners um, is that negotiating the pressures of self-censorship is a kind of a craftsmanship, in fact, to be nurtured and honed. And I'll get back to that in a little while. So rather than it necessarily being something that's um, always something that's terrible, that's awful, that you have to avoid at all, um, you know, at, uh, you know, at all costs. In some contexts, in, in many contexts, in fact, it's a reality. So we have to face that reality and we have to be ready to deal with it. And being ready to deal with that is part of our responsibility as artists and curators. So I thought that I should actually um, uh, give you then um, what I understand to be a kind of good working definition of censorship versus self-censorship. So in this context, I consider censorship to be the suppression of ideas, including artistic expression, by any entity with the power to do so which could be the state, could be the church in certain circumstances, or a private entity, such as a corporation, for example, um, that's funding, okay? Um, whereas self-censorship is the suppression of 
ideas, including artistic expression by an individual during the creative process or an institution during the curatorial process. Okay, and it's much more subtle. It blends in with other parts of the creative and curatorial process. So it's sometimes hard to point out. It doesn't violate any laws. And there are slippages in self-censorship. For example, what might seem on an institutional level might seem like an act of self-censorship. For example, a museum board decides to self-censor an exhibition. So on an institutional level, the board says to the curator, we're going to self-censor this exhibition, okay? To the curators involved, that might be experienced as an act of censorship. Sorry, I'm having just a little trouble with my forwarding the slides. But we can always tell self-censorship from self-censorship because it's accompanied by silences. And those silences reflect a kind of denial. And that denial suggests a kind of a shame, okay? Because self-censorship, um, certainly in the West, it's like it's not supposed to happen. We're supposed to be, uh, you know, we're supposed to be societies, democratic societies um, framed by self-expression, uh, defined by self-expression. And when we admit to self-censorship, um, then we are, we feel shame. Also, um, I think they're accompanied by silences, by this denial, because the idea is still prevalent that museums are neutral spaces. And if we believe somehow that museums are neutral spaces, then they're not supposed to have a curatorial voice then that would face self-censorship. But those silences then make it difficult to challenge and then sometimes even harder to recognize exactly what is self-censorship and when it happens. But self-censorship is recognizable through its primary motive, which is fear whether it's fear of reprisal through an authoritarian entry, entity such as the state, whether it's fear of a reduction in funding through a government funder, for example, or a corporate funder, or through a loss of admissions tickets from the public or whether it's fear of reputational damage through offending publics, any of those kinds of things. And in many ways, self-censorship is more dangerous than censorship. Because whereas acts of censorship are by their very nature limited, no censor can be everywhere at the same time. Although, you know, certainly with AI, we do worry about surveillance and what its, uh, what its limits or limitlessness are um, in the future. Um, still, Self-censorship, our own ability to self-censor is, uh, is potentially limitless. Our fears, our worries can be our own worst enemy and can in many ways be potentially more dangerous than any censor working from outside.
However, it's important that when we think about self-censorship as being a potential danger and a limit on our freedom, it's important to also recognize that sometimes self-censorship can be an ethical good. Some of my collaborators in the project on Hong Kong and China, for example, brought to me examples of ways that sometimes they had to self-censor to protect others. That can be an ethical good. And there are examples also of self-censorship, even in this country, that some might see as an ethical good because of changes in, um, in the way we understand the world. So here's an example of the removal of the Theodore Roosevelt statue from the American Museum of Natural History um, just last year. This statue was removed um, from the entrance because um, it was considered um, inappropriate that um, underneath this equestrian of Teddy Roosevelt um, are um, images of a Native American, oh, sorry, the wrong way, of a Native American and an African American man and um, that are thought to be very subservient and um, lower down and very hierarchical um, and, uh, um, uh, and uh, not appropriate um, in this setting. So, um, so the work was removed um, and uh, um, the city of New York agreed to this um, and uh, the, the sculpture was um, uh, put, uh, was, was transferred to, um, trying to remember, somewhere in the Midwest, um, uh, oh, I did it again, sorry. Um, somewhere in the Midwest, um, where a new Theodore Roosevelt library is being built, might be in the Dakota somewhere, um, and they will exhibit it in a new way, in a new context that, um, poses questions, about this sculpture and looks at the issue of race. Um, but it's also understood that Roosevelt had now had, um, uh, he had very um, questionable and um, uncomfortable racist views about eugenics. So that helps us to, um, to feel that this sculpture absolutely doesn't have a place at this Museum of Natural History. So my paper, one more second, sorry. So my paper in the book focuses on the Hong Kong and China situations, acknowledging the distinct but increasingly overlapping situations of practitioners in Hong Kong and mainland China in the late years of the last decade. Um, so the research captures what was happening on the ground from around 2016 to 2000. 18, 17, 18, something like that. Um, I had a um, three-year research grant um, from uh, the uh, British Academy to, uh, to go back and forth to Hong Kong. And I convened a research network there with Hong Kong artisan curators and with um, 
uh, mainland Chinese artists and curators. Um, some, it was very hard sometimes to get the mainland artists and curators to feel totally comfortable meeting in the group. There was a smaller group of them just because the costs at the time were so much higher for them, the risks. So sometimes they would meet with me individually instead, but there was a small group of them who would convene with the others. Um, sometimes I went to China to talk with them. Sometimes they came to Hong Kong. It just depended. Um, but, uh, but it was extremely revelatory and, uh, um, and, uh, um, and I was also taken by the relevance of their strategies to the rest of the world, including North America and Europe, and found that absolutely it was too easy to say that censorship happens somewhere else, you know, in to, uh, um, to authoritarian, in, in, in cultures with authoritarian governments. So generally what I found was that in mainland China, that, um, that authorities use the illusion that censorship was omnipresent, was seamless to encourage a kind of naturalization of self-censorship. So what I mean to say is that the officials there used, tried to create this sense that censorship was happening all the time um, so that um, people would feel that they always had to self-censor. And they did this by making censorship something that was random so you never knew when it was going to happen, meaning that it could happen at any time. And also by never making clear what that red line was. So you never knew the rules and you never knew um, when things might change. And you never knew how much you could push. And in museums and galleries, self-censorship was encouraged through a system of minders. So at particularly at, um, you know, particularly at large museums in China, you would have a minder there, okay? They would have a minder implanted there. So that would watch over things. And they would have at museums and particularly later on. So, so um, uh, private galleries and museums in their first years in the early part of the 20 teens were given more latitude. But um, by, you know, by the later part of the 2000 teens, they were given much less of that um, freedom and more, much more um, uh, oversight in this approval process. And the approval process could be you know, extremely arduous, again, could change at any time. Um, and um, oftentimes when things were, um, when some, when there was a problem found, it was oftentimes found at the very last minute um, to make things feel that much worse. So rather than saying two months before or six months before, I'm sorry, this can't happen, it was the day before. So you've put in so much time and energy and resources into it that you feel just awful, right? Like you never want to try it again. Um, so it's, you know, extremely 
extremely frustrating. Um, in Hong Kong, censorship, at least until these changes that happened in 2019 and 20, the, and then the national security law that was introduced in 2020, I think. Um, there was a more traditionally covert censorship to affect self-censorship. So traditionally, under one country, two systems, the policy um, that was established uh, with China, the Chinese takeover of Hong Kong, um, this covert censorship was done through a lack of diversity of funders, a lack of venues, and increasing mainlandization, meaning that um, there was such an integration between mainland China and Hong Kong in terms of funding, for example. Let's say you know, um, you couldn't tell in terms of a, a corporation how much was Hong Kong based and how much was mainland based. That, um, you know, you didn't want to offend mainland ideas. So it was very difficult. So, but of course, now, you know, through the national security law, um, mainland political forces are exerting overt censorship. And now even um, we have increased surveillance and pressure abroad as well. So um, there was just a, a report put out by um, the UK um, uh, 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 it's called um, Index on Censorship. It's a fantastic um, group that um, monitors uh, uh, censorship activity. And it's a fantastic report that came out about a month or two ago and found that, um, that in fact, um, in the arts that uh, Chinese authorities are trying to stop, censor, and um, uh, both Chinese artists, Chinese uh, curators working abroad, and also um, uh, European uh, curators that are working with Chinese and Hong Kong um, uh, artists and curators abroad. So there's many, many pressures abroad as well. So it's becoming increasingly dangerous everywhere. But at the same time, there are some fantastic strategies being deployed by artists and curators. So I want to absolutely stress the kind of agency that artists and curators are using. Everything from wordplay. Um, so if you can't use one word on you know, on the internet, for example, you use a different language. Um, you might use alternative platforms. So for example, if, um, if you can't do an exhibition on a certain theme, um, you might then just do a program because the Chinese authorities, for example, find that the bigger the audience, the more risky um, they feel the, the project is and the more likely they are to censor. But if it's a program that lasts an evening, they're not gonna feel as threatened. And so an interesting example of that, um, it doesn't have to do with the program per se, but um, um, I'll use the uh, I'll use the example of Video Bureau. 
um, which has a collection of video art. Now, video art and um, uh, and performance art is considered some of the most risky um, in uh, in China and Hong Kong because of the live element, which is considered to be, you know, um, unpredictable. And um, whenever that's shown in an exhibition, it's the most targeted material. So Video Bureau opened up under the auspices, an artist actually funds it, but um, it's a small library with outposts in uh, Guangzhou and in Beijing. And because it's small and, you know, works as a kind of a library, they function under the radar. And fascinatingly, they, um, so you can all, only about maybe five or six people could use it at one time, but they have an amazing library of video art. And fascinatingly, they catalog it only by artist name, not by subject matter, so that um, you couldn't easily know um, just by a search whether a particular artist had um, had a piece um, on uh, the subject of the Tiananmen Square massacre, for example. So that's how they protect those artists. Um, artists and curators also have sensitivities to time and location. So they think about doing something sometimes that's, uh, you know, they won't do it at a time when, uh, let's say the, you know, this, the, the, the Communist Party is having a big meeting, for example, or on a political holiday. Location is more difficult right now because, as I mentioned before, even artists and curators in exile are being pressured. And artists working in small villages don't always have, you know, anonymity. So it's difficult, but, but still sometimes there are locations that are hot and less hot. Um, they work to build strategic alliances. So, for example, um, uh, um, I know of one organization that has decided on their board not to have a director of the board. So no one person can be blamed, for example, but everyone has equal responsibility. Um, you don't always know who's blacklisted, that's not published, but, um, but if you know from experience, um, let's say an artist that you show, um, uh, you know, is, uh, um, is censored, um, then you may find out that that artist has been blacklisted, then you might know the next time around, you might sacrifice that blacklisted artist for the sake of a project, even though you'd love to have them in, you know that you can't do it. So I've heard of, you know, how that happens sometimes, or even someone you suspect might be blacklisted so that, uh, you know, so that the whole project can go on. I also know of, uh, of many, many artists and curators who think differently than we might in the West, who think of the long run versus the short run, who think in terms of generations, what we might not be able to do in our generation, they're thinking in the long run of future generations. And one thing I, I love is when a work is censored sometimes, make the act visible. Um, so I have, you might not be able to see it on the screen, but this is a show that I saw in Shanghai at Rockbund Museum, which is a, um, a contemporary uh, private gallery. And um, when, uh, when a work was censored, uh, a few video works by the artist Song Dong, um, the curator um, 
uh, uh, the works you can see here. He kept the video screens blank then and wrote underneath with a beautiful, uh, ironic sense of humor. This video cannot be displayed due to non-technical reasons so that um, it was still made clear. It wasn't just the whole act of censorship wasn't erased. I found also that in China and Hong Kong, they had um, beautifully um, culturally appropriate, but distinct ways of thinking about the ways that, um, that they would um, work to uh, approach um, the pressures of self-censorship. So in China, they talked about it as lobbing a ping pong ball across to the opponent's side to get it just to the edge without going over. Okay, um, uh, so of course you're taking a risk by lobbing it all the way to the edge, but you know it's getting it right to that edge without going over. Whereas in Hong Kong, they talked about it in terms of Bruce Lee's concept of, uh, you know, um, of be water, my friend, that sense of, you know, having that flow of water, of, of constant like flow of going with the flow of water in the way that Bruce Lee um, did his martial arts, um, of having that strength of being able to be flexible and flow like the water. So fascinating ways, metaphors of thinking about the strength um, that it takes to um, negotiate with the pressures of self-censorship. And so it takes me back to then that idea that I mentioned early on um, <clears throat> of one of the... Uh, um, a comment of one of the uh, uh, one of the participants in the research network, who was a curator and artist from Hong Kong, who commented that she wanted to learn what she called the craftsmanship of negotiating the pressures of censorship and self-censorship in particular from her mainland colleagues, that she saw that they had so much experience with this and that the environment for her and her Hong Kong colleagues was very quickly degrading and that there was an art to this um, and, that, um, and that she absolutely um, that this was absolutely a part of what she needed to do to, um, to maintain her agency. And absolutely, this, this curatorial self-censorship doesn't just happen somewhere else, for example, in the context of authoritarian regimes. So one example relatively recently is at the Guggenheim Museum in 2017, where they, um, uh, the museum itself uh, self-censored three works, um, including Huang Yong Ping's Theater of the World, which was thought to be the centerpiece originally of the whole project, though um, the uh, the exhibition itself was named Theater of the World, and this work was supposed to have been at the the pinnacle of the exhibition, um, at the top of the ramp of the Guggenheim, um, and the work was supposed to have had. Um, uh, over a thousand um, insects and uh, reptiles in it and meant to prey upon each other, to eat each other over the course of the exhibition. Um, there were two other works also that were 
Um, they were video works. Um, this was live, but the other two works um, this, this is the work um, as it was shown live somewhere else a few years beforehand. This is the work as it was shown um, at the Guggenheim without any of the animals in it. Um, and there were two other works that were um, self-censored, uh, were um, video works um, that have videos of of works with animals that were performed live earlier at galleries. Um, those works were potentially more vicious. Um, one had two pigs in them, two breeding pigs that were copulating. Another one had um, eight, uh, um, uh, dogs had um, eight pit bulls that were um, tethered. Each one was tethered to a um, treadmill. That one in some ways was the most disturbing, but they were video works. Um, and um, the museum got a, um, uh, a lot of pressure from animal rights groups. Um, that these works should not be in the show. However, they should have known that they would have gotten this pressure and they didn't fully explain um, why these Chinese artists, um, this was a work of all Chinese artists that were, had made art um, just after, in the years after the Tiananmen Square massacre, why these artists, these three artists, has chosen to use animals in these works, and why the metaphor of animals and violence was so powerful and potent to them, um, why these were such powerful metaphors, and perhaps if they had explained this, that might have um, made a great deal of difference. But we might also talk about even things like the um, the Guggenheim, sorry, um, the uh, National Gallery London exhibition uh, of Gauguin portraits from uh, 2019, um, in which they did not talk about the way that Gauguin had um, uh, you know, been sexually active with 12-year-old girls in Tahiti that he was depicting in this exhibition. Um, um, he, you know, there were scholars that, that did discuss these things a bit in the exhibition catalog, but they chose not to talk about it in the exhibition itself. They skirted the issue. So what is it about that? Um, and uh, so there are lots of ways that we might talk about that kind of self-censorship in this day and age. So despite very real risks, Practitioners do have agency when facing the pressures of self-censorship. And what our book demonstrates is that the pressures to self-censor are not best represented by a perpetrator-victim binary, but there are in fact all kinds of areas in between. And if one is prepared, those Guggenheim, um, those Guggenheim curators were not prepared. They were reactionary, and they pulled those they pulled those works at the last minute. They were not prepared. They did not talk to audiences in advance. Um, they were naive about what to expect there. 
And I would argue that learning how to negotiate the pressures of self-censorship is fundamental to the curator's remit, no matter where you live in this world. Otherwise, decisions are made through risk aversion rather than through deliberative ethical decision-making. And this is especially vital if we're putting our public's front and center and are committed to exploring what to some might be contentious issues. So, some helpful websites, the National Coalition Against Censorship, what my, uh, my co-editor works for, the Index on Censorship, in the UK, and also the International Coalition of Sites of Consciousness, a, uh, um, a global organization. So thank you very much. I'm glad to take questions. Hi, Janet. This is Max. Um, if you could just stop sharing your screen so we can see each other. Sure. Yes. Uh, glad to. Let's see. So if you have any questions, hello, everybody. Um, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat, um, and uh, we will go ahead and get to those now. Uh, my first question for you is, um, let me just add my thing, there we go. So when you talk about there are good types of, um, there are ethical types of self-censorships and there are unethical types of um, ethical censorship, what ethical framework are you using for that? Because I can see that varying from person to person. Um, I can see different institutions having using difficult, uh, different ethical frameworks to decide what is ethical and what's not. So how do we determine that, determine that very philosophical sort of uh, dilemma? Mm -hmm. How did you do it throughout your writing? Right. Uh-huh. So, um, so when I talk about ethics, I think about um, a kind of a a tripartite approach. So there are ethics codes that we look at. Okay, um, so we can look at the uh, the AAM ethics codes and the ICOM ethics code, and um, you know, um, and uh, whatever other ethics codes that we are responsible to, um, depending on our field, whether we're archaeologists or anthropologists or art dealers or whatever that happens to be. And most likely, well, we may have some collisions among those. So we have to figure out the messiness of that, right? Um, it's never perfect. And so we have those codes. Beyond those codes, um, we also have values, right? Values or principles. And, um, and we have to think about what those values and principles might be. And we have values driven ethics. Um, and, um, and those might be, uh, you know, um, social justice values that our, our particular institution um, might, uh, might prioritize. Um, but it might depend on the institution, or it might depend on the project, or it might depend on, uh, you know, um, on, uh, you know, it might depend on the, the larger context. Um, so, uh, so that, you know, so that may vary what the, what the, what, what, what that, you know, what those principles and values might be. Um, and then there are the case studies. So there are case studies that also impact us. Um, but I look to ethics as the convergence of those three things, of case studies, the particular of, particulars of case studies that, um, um, that we look at that influence us, um, and, uh, and the... Um, and the codes and conventions that influence us and the particular um, values and principles that influence us. And yeah, so, so. those values and it, those values and uh, principles. Now, now, when we go back to thinking about ethics in general, we can say that um, museum ethics is a is applied ethics, 
Okay. So that's different. So museum ethics is applied ethics. So that's applied ethics is a kind of an, an ethics um, in the field. So um, it's thinking about, um, you know, it's thinking about how we, you know, how we do good in our fields. So it's in some ways no different than uh, environmental ethics or dental ethics or business ethics. So it's different than um, ethics as philosophy. We might draw from ethics as philosophy. And of course, there are many, many different kinds of ways that we understand you know, um, you know, ethics as philosophy, but museum ethics is the way that we might apply that to a particular field to do good. And, um, and the way I understand it as applied ethics is according to this tripartite approach that we look at the codes, we, and, but the codes in themselves are not enough because they are oftentimes a, a do no harm mechanism um, and they're a reactive mechanism. So we have to also look at, uh, at values and principles and we have to look also at case studies. So I guess um, if I follow, it, it seems like it would be pretty hard to come up with a sort of universal code of ethics that you can view every situation through if it all sort of depends on variables and code works and which sort of ethical code you're using, you know, for- Absolutely, you know, it's, it's very, it's, um, there is no such thing and it's a dangerous thing to do because mm -hmm. even if, you know, so we might think of the ICOM, the international, you know, the, the international uh, code of ethics as being as close to that as we can get. But in fact, if you look at it, and I've uh, I've run workshops with uh, with ICOM in various countries, and of course, the way they apply it will be different in those different countries. The way that they understand the ICOM code in Brazil is different than the way they understand it in Norway, of course, and um, and that's uh, that's to be understood and acknowledged. Um, so, uh, yes, um, to look for something that's universal, you know, codes have to be living and breathing and, and, and I think it's important also that they need to change on some level, um, more frequently than they do. And that's why, that's why we need, um, the, uh, the case studies to help us to see how they change. So what happens if we have two people who are viewing the same issue through their own unique lenses of perspective and coming to different ethical conclusions and say they're both museum professionals that are just not seeing eye to eye on a particular ethical issue? How do we that's, resolve that? That's, that's what healthy discourse is. That's what you absolutely need. That's what healthy discourse is. Um, that in fact, these discussions are what ethics is based on. Ethics is messy and, um, and it requires this kind of healthy discourse. And if you don't have this healthy discourse, that's when things get scary. Yeah, so uh, sort of uh, changing gears, how does self-censorship differ between maybe a science museum, an art museum, and a history museum? Are there any differences in how those different types of museums might self-censor or is there some sort of uh, thing they universally they all deal with? Um, I think that the, the kinds of issues they might deal with might be different on some level and certain kinds of museums will be in the spotlight at certain moments. So for example, a science museum right now might feel under pressure around um, the issue of, of abortion, right? So science museums might feel right now like they can't talk about abortion. Um, and um, when in fact, um, 
this might be something that is particularly needed right now. Uh, science, certain science museums might be under the gun. Also, they have been for a long time around um, issues of environmental issues. What can they and can't they say about environmental issues depending on who their funders are? So, um, so uh, you know, some people think that only art museums uh, have, uh, you know, particular issues around uh, self-censorship. But science museums also have issues around, uh, around self-censorship, and uh, as do history museums. Uh, and uh, we certainly know right now in terms of uh, um, uh, issues around uh, um, school books right now in Florida and um, what can and can't be said around uh, uh, African-American history. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, how um, the kind of censorship that's happening uh, uh, around school books and, uh, and around uh, um, AP courses uh, in African-American history. So um, that leads me also to question um, what can and cannot be said in in museums and um, uh, and um, and who's feeling pressure and not feeling pressure in what can and cannot be said in in narratives around African American history and who's funding what. So uh, so very very difficult. Uh, very, very difficult uh, conversations in, in many ways in, in certain states with uh, conservative constituencies. Yeah, so speaking of conservatives and uh, I guess liberals, um, one of the big criticisms I hear of the museum industry as a whole is that we talk a lot about institutional capture in our country today. You know, you might have people that say the Supreme Court has been, is an institution that has been captured by the right. Academia is usually accused of being captured by the left. Usually from the discourse I hear, usually museums get lumped in with sort of an institutional capture by the left and that there's uh, liberal narratives that get pushed in museums or le I don't know, leftist liberal, center left, whatever you want to call it, and that museum employees have to cater to uh, uh, the, the liberal constituents, the liberal audiences and push these narratives. At the, is, that, is there any truth to that narrative or is that just a total wrong at a generalization? I think I I think it's a really mixed bag and it's too easy to uh I think it's way too easy to overgeneralize. Um and uh there are many, many different kinds of museums and many different kinds of exhibitions. Um and I think it it really, really depends. Um uh and I would say that many museums are still being pressured to be neutral spaces. Uh, and many funders still think that that's the case. So, um, uh, and, and I would say most museums in the United States are still very small museums with uh, just a couple of employees that um that uh, don't have that if you go to uh you know AAM the uh, American uh, Alliance of Museums conference um you'll find that uh and and it, although in fact that's not even the best marker of that because most most museums that have you know that number of employees can't even afford to go there but um but most museums do just have you know um one or two employees there are smaller historical societies and things like that that um that uh you know that are just kind of barely making do and uh, so it depends even how you define what a museum is in that way. So, uh, so I think we have quite a, you know, quite a spectrum. Um, and, 
um, I think there's an incredible diversity of institutions and um, most museums try to be responsive to, um, to trying to understand the questions of our world um, within their brief, uh, whatever that is, um, uh, without being, um, without having, uh, a, a, you know, a knee-jerk agenda, without being reductive. I don't think that museums try to be reductive, but exploratory and, um, and nonetheless, um, responsible to still um, making for a better world, however that is. So uh, kind of follow-up uh, question to this question is from Kenneth Torino. Kind of thank you for the question. He says, so what can museum associations, thing I guess like AAM and ASLH and NEMA and whatever, what can they do to address this issue? And Kenneth, when you're saying this issue, can you just explain a little bit more what particular part of the issue do you mean? So do you mean self-censorship or is that you're talking specifically about self-censorship, Ken? And Ken, if you want to turn your mic on, you're more than... Um, I'm more glad than to talk to you directly. That, that just makes it easier. <laughs> How to address self-censorship. Uh, okay. Uh-huh. That's a really great question. In the UK, um, we specifically have um, uh, one of our uh, principles is specifically addresses, um, you know, freedom of expression, whereas AAM code doesn't do that. Um, but even the AAM um, co uh, sorry, even the, the, U the UK, the, sorry, the UK, the Museums Association Code, even though it does identify freedom of expression, it doesn't do anything to say how. So um, I think um, by pointing to the guidelines, such as the excellent guidelines that the National Coalition Against Censorship has, those excellent guidelines, I think that's the best preparation that, um, that we can have. And I think if they ran more workshops, um, that could help practitioners to be familiar with those guidelines and to use them, that that would be incredibly helpful, incredibly helpful, that we all need to familiarize ourselves with this. So it's not such a surprise um, that that should be something that AAM has also on its website that it's pointing to and that they work with National Coalition on Censorship to run these workshops, to partner with them, that that would be extremely, extremely helpful. That well, certainly just, is one way. I just on Mike, this is Ken Torino, and I just want to say, I hope you will do some of these. <laughs> Because I do think there's a real value in, what, uh, in learning more about it, because you've given me a new way of looking at it um, myself. I teach museum studies, and I think students get so much out of this. And I also think our, at our museum conferences. So I urge you <laughs> to please do some sessions at ASLH and AAM and even NEMA. Uh-huh. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. It's lovely to meet you. Thank you, Kenneth. So um, uh, let's think about this in the framework of the First Amendment Museum. Uh, since you know, you're a board member, I'm a staff member, why not use ourselves as a case study? So we're a, a self-proclaimed nonpartisan institution. What, what issues do you think we're going to run into ethically as a nonpartisan institution or in regards to self-censorship? What challenges does that nonpartisan label uh, uh, create? I personally think it creates some problems. And I, I don't want to say too much, you know, as a, as a board member, but I think it creates a kind of conflict in that um, I think it's, it's problematic to be totally nonpartisan. 
Um, and, um, and I think over time that, um, that, um, that we may find that, um, that it's impossible to be nonpartisan, that, um, that we may find that we need to, to speak up and speak out, um, uh, in our role, uh, and, um, and, uh, um, and, uh, are you self-censoring just out of curiosity? Perhaps, you know, <laughs> perhaps I, I am quite way. a bit when I do these, so I, I totally, uh -huh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. perhaps I am in a way, but you know, in some ways we're also a startup. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, so it will be interesting to see how that happens. I've also suggested to the board that um, that we need to be prepared for any potential, you know, for any potential controversy that comes our way. So we have an exhibition coming up called, you know, from the slants, and um, and. Uh, um, and uh, we don't know what controversy might come with that or other exhibitions. And I don't think we've talked enough about um, how we might prepare for that. And so you'll have me on board, but, um, but I think that um, we need to prepare for that more in advance. Yeah. Um, That's I, partly I why I joined the board. Sure. Yeah, I always think about that a lot, too. Um, you know, we deal a lot with these issues, these partisan issues, political issues, philosophical issues. And, um, you know, I, I wonder it, well, what the difference would be if you could just take the gloves off and say what you really want to say all the time. What, what if I could really say what I want to say all the time? I probably wouldn't get anybody else to do the speaker series anymore. They probably wouldn't want to do it. But, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, you do sometimes fantasize about like, oh, I'd love to just give you my honest to God take right now sort of thing with people. But I well, have a question. Of, course, uh -huh. of course, there is there is a there is a very interesting question, and there's no perfect answer. What is the relationship between self censorship and good, appropriate editing? Right. Mm -hmm. But we have to think about that professional editing, right? So we're always needing to think about language and. Um, and when are we doing appropriate editing, right? So um, we all need to be judicious. We all need to be diplomatic. We all need to be generous and kind to one another. So, um, so we need to think about, you know, about the differences there, right? Absolutely. So uh, sort of, I have two last questions sort of wrapping it up, both for the audience. So I have one from Natasha Mayers. Uh, Natasha is a... I guess I'll really call Natasha a friend of the First Time Museum. We've known her for a while now. So hello, Natasha. Uh, is there less uh, self-censorship in countries that provide more financial and cultural support to their artists? Where is there where there is a less need to make safe art? Mm. That's a really good question. I would say, wait, can you just read the question one more time so I get in sure. a little bit more time to think this is an is, excellent yeah. question. Is there less self-censorship in countries that provide more financial and cultural support to their artists, where there is less need to make safe art? Hmm. Um, I would say that, um, that I haven't found that at all, um, that in some ways that, um, there is sometimes more self-censorship because the um, when you have that kind of government funding that um, there's, you know, um, there's less diversity than a funding and you feel that um, that you can't, <clears throat> that you can't critique in many ways. So it's, um, so it also can be problematic on some level, can be very problematic. There's, there's no perfect way 
Um, there is no perfect way. So if you look at what's happening in Europe, for example, um, I would say that um, that uh, that there's lots and lots of uh, you know of critique, um, lots of lot, lots and lots of. Uh, um, of uh, self-censorship um, going on. Although, you know, although I'm not sure that, I think that in literature, there's more analysis of it than there is um, sometimes in, uh, in art um in the artistic discourse that i've seen more in literature um but it's you know it's it's fascinating um but you can look you know in other parts of europe too it, it's a fascinating question and it's constantly moving as well constantly constantly moving so uh, final, uh, final question from Kenneth. Um, will you be presenting on the on the book at any upcoming conferences? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, I have in the past, and I have some other things online. Um, uh, I have some other things online. So if you look online, and um, and also on my, I might have a couple things on my website. Um, and also, so I think I did one, um, there's something maybe on the, uh, yeah, if you look online, you can probably find a few. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Janet. We appreciate it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, please, um, uh, well, to anybody watching, I'll soon be uploading this video. So if you want to share it, uh, get the recording, it'll soon be on the First Time Museum's website and our YouTube channel. So again, thank sure. you so much, Janet. Sure, and Ken, if you'd like me to to come to Boston and uh, and give a talk for your students at some point, I'd be glad to do it. Okay, so take That's care, good. and uh, you know, and and thank you everyone for coming. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Marstein. Take care. Bye.